Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lotoibi and Dr. Alam for this opportunity. Um, so we'll talk briefly about favorable risk uh, EK myelogenous leukemia. And uh, mostly I'll focus on Corbani factor AML and NPM1 mutated AML. So, and these are my disclosures. So MRD in favorable risk AML, there are certain advantages in MRD monitoring for favorable risk AML. Particularly, this is mostly defined translocations, whether it's acute promyocytic leukemia, core binding factor AML, or it is defined mutation, NPM1, CBP alpha. And most of these mutations you can actually quantitatively monitor by molecular methods. So in most of these uh, favorable risk AMLs, the data support that the molecular MRD possibly trumps flow cytometry. And in my presentation, mostly I'll use core binding factor as the paradigm, and towards the end, we will talk a little bit about NPM1 mutated AML. It's just because I have a particular interest in core binding factor AML. Uh, we'll get the easy one out of the way first to what to do with MRD monitoring in APL. I mean, luckily, uh, we don't face this problem you know, too often anymore because with the frontline treatment being so, so effective, uh, APL relapses are becoming you know, very vanishingly uncommon. And, uh, but still, if there is persistence or reappearance of PCR in APL, uh, this has to be treated as a clinical relapse and has to be treated as uh, with, with salvage treatment, with full uh, salvage treatment. So that's sort of an easy decision for APL. And the decisions are not necessarily, you know, so easy for core binding factor AML or for NPM1 mutated AML. As we know, core binding factor AML is a, mostly involves two translocations for translocation 821. It involves a translocation between RUNX1 and RUNX1T1, whereas in inversion 16, there is inversion happens uh, and which brings core binding factor beta in close proximity to smooth muscle myosin heavy chain. And so those are the total incidence is about you know, 15 to 20 percent of all new AMLs that we see. So the biologically, the core binding factors, they are heterodimeric transcription factors. So it, it has two units, the alpha unit and the beta unit. So beta unit, which is the core binding factor beta, which is a non DNA binding subunit. Whereas the core binding factor alpha, that is the DNA binding subunit, and it has got three different uh, subunits, RUNX1, RUNX2, and RUNX3. And all these core binding factor alpha subunits are required at some point in hematopoiesis for the develop, full development of, the, of hematopoiesis. The, the function of the core binding factor beta subunit is to increase or improve the DNA binding of the core binding factor alpha subunits. Now, when the translocation events happen, the initial thought was that this has a dominant negative effect because the translocation would disrupt the normal binding of core binding factor to the DNA and will disrupt normal function of the core binding factor um, proteins, which is mostly transcription factors that drive differentiation. But the, the thoughts are changing a little bit that there could be a dominant positive effect where it acquires a new transcription profile altogether so that the core binding factor units, they don't bind to the places where they're supposed to bind. And now they start binding to places where they're not supposed to bind. So that's the change that can happen potentially. And uh, here, you know, it's the core binding factor, um, the RUNX1, there are three different isoforms that can happen. And it has a RUNT homology domain, which is a DNA binding domain and a transactivation domain. So when the translocation happens, it's the runt homology domain or the DNA binding domain remains sort of intact, but it's a transactivation domain is that's interrupted. Now, the core binding factor AML, even though they are driven by this unique translocation events, there is additional mutations that are needed for the full development of the leukemia. And interestingly, uh, these mutations seem to also affect outcomes. Now, when we say core binding factor, we bring both the diseases, translocation 821 and inversion 16 under the same umbrella. But in essence, this could be two very different diseases because the outcomes are not necessarily similar in all cases. 
relapses are possible is more frequent in 821 than in version 16. And in the mutation profile, as if you see at the tyrosine kinase pathway mutations, which are at the top, they are similar in both 821 and in version 16, whereas the chromatin modifying mutations and the cohesin mutations are much more frequent in translocation 821. And at the bo bottom in the graphical form, you can see that the tyrosine kinase mutations are much more frequent in inversion 16, and, less, and the chromatin and the cohesin mutations are much more frequent in the 821 translocation. The question is that, you know, do they matter? Um, yes, they do. Looks like the mutations, uh, particularly in the chromatin modifier and the cohesin mutations, they tend to impact along with the tyrosine kinase mutations the outcomes. If you have tyrosine mutations and an additional chromatin or cohesin mutation, then the relapse chances are much higher. And if you do not have these mutations, the relapse chances are much lower. And if you have, you know, half or half and half, you have a tyrosine kinase mutation, but do not have the chromatin or the cohesin mutations, then you still relapse, but the relapse risk is lower when you have both. And Kind of looking at the acquisition of these mutations in the disease evolution of um, A21 and in version 16, the, as the allelic frequency goes high, the chances are these, these mutations are acquired earlier. And whereas the allelic frequency, when they're lower, the chances are these, these mutations are acquired later. So if you see like FLIT3 and RAS, these mute kit, these are possibly somewhat later acquired mutations, whereas SMC mutation or JAK2 mutation, EGH2 mutation, uh, many of these cohesin or STAG2 for that matter, like cohesin and uh, chromatin modifying mutation, they tend to happen earlier. And so is true for inversion 16, that the kinase mutations are possibly later events, whereas the chromatin mutations or the um, or the cohesin mutations, they are possibly much earlier event. And this is sort of the diagram to kind of depict that uh, disease evolution in core binding factor AML. Now, what about the tyrosine kinase mutations? This is an older study from the French group, which showed that kit mutation, whether it's exon 8 or exon 17, they alone possibly do not matter. But if you take all the tyrosine kinase mutation kit RAS and FLIT3 together, presence of one or three mutations increases the risk of relapse. And you know this is the cumulative incidence of relapse and this is the relapse-free survival. Now, for core factor AML, advantage is that you have unique disease-defining fusion genes, like RANX1, RANX1, T1, RANX1, T1 translocation, core binding factor beta, and MYH11 translocations, and so they permit for measurable residual disease, and you can actually do it by quantitative RT-PCR, where the sensitivity can reach up to one times 10 to the power minus five minus six, which is uh, sensitivity-wise much higher than what you can achieve with flow. Now, the question is, what's the optimal reduction of transcript? The, there is a limitation in this um, that unlike CML, where you have the international standard, you don't have full standardization of methods. So most large institutes or large groups, they develop their own methods, but there needs to be a, some sort of um, cohesive uh, utilization and the standardization of these methods. Uh, so this was one of the early papers from the, um, uh, the MRC group in UK, where they had looked at the outcomes depending on uh, QPCR reduction. If you have more than three log reduction, your chances of relapse is much higher. But as the, the QPCR reduction is less and less, the chances of uh, the disease relapsing is much higher. So the top one is the cumulative incidence of relapse, and the lower one is the relapse free survival. And this is in translocation 821 patients using bone marrow data. Similarly, they had also used peripheral blood data for inversion 16 patients because in the inversion 16 patients, the peripheral blood data was adequately informative. And as you can see, the higher, I mean, the 
lower the disease burden or if you can get a tree log or more reduction in the qpcr then the chances of relapse is is much lower so this is a summary of the data that for in 821 the bone marrow log, log reduction is more prognostic compared to peripheral blood because this question keeps on coming that do we need to keep doing bone marrows to monitor uh, mrd or is peripheral blood good enough looks like for 821 you may need a bone marrow and a three log reduction after induction and four log reduction after course three is indicative of sustained relapse survival. And in some patients, you may have a very small amount of disease detectable in the long run. We have patients who are going seven, eight years in full remission and the disease is not coming back and they may still have a very small amount of disease persistence. But if you have a rising QPCR value, then you may have to seriously think about um, that this patient may be relapsing and you may have to get you know things in order so that you can plan for salvage treatment or stem cell trans transplant for that matter whereas on inversion 16 the marrow transcript reduction there was no critical cutoff but peripheral blood transcript values were more informative so it's e easier in a way because you know the sampling is is easier and QPCR values less than 0.01 after induction and after course three indicative of sustained relapse for survival. And if you have any persistent QPCR positivity in peripheral blood, that was associated with relapse. So we did a very similar analysis where we looked at QPCR reduction at the end of induction. So if you have uh, optimal QPCR reduction, which we termed as less than 0.1, the chances of overall survival and a relapse rate survival is, is much, much higher compared to if you do not achieve that optimal reduction. So this was at the end of induction after cycle one. What about when you, the patient finishes all induction consolidations? Again, the same thing, and the QPCR value changes here now. Now it is less than 0 0.01. And if you have a sustained QPCR reduction of that value, the relapse rate survival is much better and overall survival is now approaching about you know eight years uh, i mean so 80 percent or so in six seven years time what about patients who do not get the optimal response after cycle one but say after cycle three or cycle six patient gets an optimal response so those patients also tend to do well but patients who do not have a sustained um, gradual reduction in the QPCR value, they tend to relapse and, and die much quicker compared to the patients who may not have had an optimal response after cycle one, but after cycle three or so, if they get an optimal response, the survival is still better. What about treatment? Because, it, you know, um, we have been using a flag-based kind of an induction consolidation for last about 15 years or so, um, we used initially used Milotarg or, or Gemtuzumab, but when Gemtuzumab was withdrawn from the US market, we started with uh, IDA, uh, and, and this is the regimen. The impact of out is that we just published this paper in AJH uh, about two months back. The patients who got flag Milotarg did much better than the patients who got flag IDA. What about QPCR reduction? Again, it also reflected what we saw in the clinical outcome, that MRD reduction after induction or after cycle three or after end of therapy was much better in the flag myelotar group compared to the flag IDA group. And that actually translated to better relapse survival and better overall survival. Now, just to pause that, you know, a deeper MRD response early on after cycle one or cycle three is important. It's imperative that we follow MRD by qPCR. So far we have done with bone marrow in, in our case, uh, but as the data uh, from the UK group shows, that for inversion 16, you may be able to use peripheral blood for the monitoring purpose. We do bone marrow every two or three cycles for initial couple of years time. And the incorporation of gemtuzumab frontline does better than idorubicin. And similarly, in the, in the alpha trial, they had used about three doses of myelotarg with 3 plus 7 during induction. 
Now the question is that kit mutation or flit tree mutations can um, worsen outcome. Can we add these inhibitors in the frontline setting? There are some trials ongoing. There's a trial from the um, uh, from the Alliance Group, uh, which was the original CLGB group, and there's another trial from the German group incorporating kit inhibitor. In this case, mostly using the certinib in a frontline setting to look at outcomes. And the other question is, can we identify patients who are not going to achieve optimal uh, QPC reduction? So that's maybe you know, indicative by the baseline mutations, like particularly cohesin mutation, chromatin modifier mutations. So patients who have these mutations, they may not achieve an optimal QPC response. So they, maybe these are the patients we need to watch closer or think about at least getting a stem cell a team involved early on that in case we need to go there that you know we are we are ready and then the other question is how to mitigate relapse risk uh, again as i said the stem cell transplant evaluation for suboptimal mrd response hma maintenance maintenance with decidabin or is a cytidine or can we use the oral drugs now that we have this oral hmas available High level of MRD elimination can be used NK cell or CAR T cells or bispecific antibodies. And eventually, again, you know, can the baseline mutation profile identify patients with suboptimal response? Some of these questions are still not quite answered, and we're trying to answer some of these questions. We did do a hypomethylating agent decided in maintenance in Corbani factor AML. The three groups of patients, the group one is the patient who had persistent QPCR after chemotherapy. Whereas for group two, they had a truncated consolidation either because of infectious complications or the patients were older, so they could not get all the planned consolidations. And in that, 2A is a group that actually had achieved an optimal MRD despite not completing all treatment, whereas the 2B is a group that has suboptimal MRD. As you can see, the group one and group 2a they did reasonably well whereas group 2b who could not complete all the consolidations and still had a suboptimal mrd they had a much higher chance of um, dying from the disease and an early intervention here the ttnt means the time to new treatment so these patients needed second line of treatment very early on what about stem cell transplant? Um, this was the data that is published from our center by the stem cell transplant group. What they had looked as the persistence of MRD positivity prior to transplant. Here they had taken a cutoff of 1%. If the patients were MRD positive at less than 1%, they did pretty well post-transplant, whereas patients who had a higher MRD positivity even after transplant, their outcomes are not so great. And this is the other data that was published in blood coming from the Chinese group. They did an approach that is somewhat similar to what we have done or the UK group has done, that they had looked at QPC reduction after induction and after about one consolidation. So after about three cycles of treatment, and the patients who were in optimal molecular response, they continued on chemotherapy alone whereas patients who were not on optimal QPC response, they were sent for allogenic stem cell transplant. But some of the patients decided that they didn't, didn't want to go with a allogenic transplant, so they just continued chemotherapy. Again, patients, if they had lost their major molecular response or an optimal molecular response, they were randomized, to, not randomized really, but they were kind of sent for allogenic stem cell transplant. So for patients who are at a low risk of disease relapse, so these are the patients who have gotten optimal MRD reduction, doing a transplant actually did harm to them. So these patients did much better if they continued with chemotherapy alone. Whereas patients who had, were at a high risk of relapse, so these are the ones who did not have an optimal MRD reduction, their relapse rates were much, much higher, and the stem cell transplant definitely benefited these patients. Um, so that's as far as the core binding factor AML goes. So what about NPM1 mutant AML? Um, NPM1 mutant AML, uh, it, it's a complex disease because there are a lot of 
permutations that can happen in, in NPM1 mutated AML. And if you take the top 10 AML mutations, you can break the NPM1 mutated uh, patient population to close to about 20, 30 subgroups. So it, it, it's a complex disease, but even, you know, despite kind of acknowledging these complications, patients who had peripheral blood QPCR positivity after cycle two of chemotherapy, uh, and, and their clinical outcomes were looked at. And as you can see, patients who are MRM negative, they had an excellent uh, overall survival and the relapse rates are much lower. Whereas the two groups that had a higher chance of relapse were patients who had concomitant FLT3 mutation and DNMT3A mutation. So these patients, if they're MRD positive, again, they have a much higher chance of relapse. Um, and this is the one without FLT3 ITD mutation, and this is the one with FLT3 ITD mutation. Whereas if they're MRD positive, if you do not have a FLT3 ITD mutation, your relapse risk is about 76%. Whereas if you have a FLT3 mutation, your relapse risk goes up to about 92% or so. And the similar situation with the NMT3 mutations too. So this is again using peripheral blood sample after cycle two of chemotherapy. What about uh, transplant? The patients who went to transplant, and if you measure their pre-transplant uh, NPM1 level, the patients who were MRD negative, they did better than patients who are MRD positive. And this is the result by the peripheral blood assessment, and this is the result by bone marrow assessment. Now, then they looked at the patients who are positive, then they try to divide them into low versus high. The cutoff was the peripheral blood transcript of 200 copies per 10 to the power 5 ABL, or for bone marrow, more than 1,000 copies. So when they looked at the low versus high, the patients who had higher MRD, they definitely had much worse outcome compared to the low MRD positivity, and these are the ones that are MRD negative. And this is by the bone marrow threshold, and this is by peripheral blood threshold. And if you combine both, so this is the outcome. Basically, again, patients who have high level of MRD, either by peripheral blood or by bone marrow, they tend to do poorer. And then this is sort of the kind of final uh, flow chart that they made. If you're MRD negative, you're low risk. If you're MRD high positive, you're high risk. Now for the MRD low positive patient population, if you have a flit ITD wild type, then you fall into the low risk group, whereas if you have a flit tree ITD mutated, then you fall into the high risk group. Now the question is that if you fall into the high risk group, what can we do? Can we use a flit tree inhibitor? What other options can we use? Can we use avoid T cell depletion from the stem cell transplant, a maintenance hypomethylating agent or other agents, donor lymphocyte, donor leukocyte um, infusions? or other immune approaches that we can use to mitigate the risk. Again, uh, finally, so this is sort of the overall thoughts that I have in terms of molecular MRD-based approach to favorable risk AML. Um, again, for favorable risk AML, it allows molecular MRD tracking, and that tracking is better than flow-based tracking. What we truly need is a standardization of assay so that when we are comparing data from different institutes or different groups, uh, we can talk the same language. Now, MRD translates towards outcome, whether it's pre-transplant or while on chemotherapy. But the question is, can we improve frontline chemotherapies? You know, can we use some sort of triplet regimens where you add other agents? In this case, at least for the core binding factor AML, uh, the use of uh, gemtuzumab definitely improves outcome, and so that should be incorporated in a standard manner. Other question is that if you have flit mutant AMLs, um, can we start adding uh, flit inhibitors or kit mutant core factor? Can you use uh, something like the satinib or other kit inhibitors? MRD-based interventions, it is one size will not fit all, and it will all depend on what level of MRD. The best option has far as we know so far is possibly stem cell transplant. Now there is a caveat that if you have a 
stem cell transplant MRD positivity, particularly for NPM1, you still have a worse outcome. So then, you know, what do you alternate interventions can you do? Can you do a maintenance with hypermethylating agent or venetoclax? Particularly, venetoclax may have a pretty good sensitivity in the NPM1 mutant AML. And there is data to suggest that some of the good risk AML patients with sorafenib maintenance, they can do well. Uh, data coming from German groups. Alternate could be cellular therapy, CAR T cell, CAR and K for MRD elimination, either prior to transplant or patients who cannot go for a transplant. And finally, immune agents like antibody drug conjugates, T cell engagers, etc. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions.